This episode of the Level Flight Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to announce that Smooth Sack Summer is officially upon us. When you're playing in the summer sun, make sure you're groomed from pubes to bump. Thanks to our friends at Manscaped, you can make this season your smoothest yet. The Performance Package 5.0 Ultra is the ultimate bundle to keep your boys downstairs cool while looking hot. Join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our exclusive offer. Get 20% off and free shipping when you go to manscaped.com and use code THPN. Summertime and trimming is easy. Every man knows how scary it can get when going for a close shave below the belt. That's why it's easier to trust Manscaped for all the sensitive areas. The Manscaped Performance Package 5.0 Ultra has everything you need to prepare for that summer bod. Manscaped was nice enough to send us something special. Inside the package we got, you'll find the star of the show, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Their fifth generation trimmer features two interchangeable next gen skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. We also have dual LED spotlights to provide contrast on multiple skin tones, three setting combs, and oh, did I mention this trimmer is waterproof? Get 20% off and free shipping with the code THPN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code THPN at manscaped.com. It's smooth sack summer, boys. Get on board or get left behind. Okay, we good to go? Mm -hmm. Always good to go. I'm just chilling at Canada Life Center. That's the hard-hitting analysis you listen to the Level Flight Podcast for. Here we go. <clears throat> Jets are a brisket team, low and slow for the first few periods. And boom, an explosion of flavor in the last few minutes of the third. I'm doing all right. Uh, better if my internet would work. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Elliot. Um, this is this is comedy. Um, I'm Brian. I'm joined by Connor. Hello. And Elliot. Hey, hey. Wow, that was fun. You're listening to the Level Flight Podcast. Welcome in, everyone, to episode 98 of the Level Flight Podcast. Creeping up on 100, um, but we'll, we'll we'll tackle that when we get there. My <laughs> name is Connor. I've got Brian here with me today. Elliot couldn't make it. Brian, how you doing? Uh, doing good. Got back from the lake yesterday. Uh, currently dealing with that post-lake trip uh, depression. Um, yeah. Because let's be real. there's even, even if it's a rainy day. A rainy day at the lake, better than a rainy day in the city. Um, you know, I was debating, I'll be honest, okay, to pull back the curtain a little. On Sunday, I was debating doing LFP live from the dock with a pickerel rig in the water and hopefully catch a fish while I was live. live. I figured that'd be a little bit iffy with the lighting and the internet. So maybe, maybe one day, but, uh, you know. I, I'm missing the opportunity to do so because I can't fish directly from my balcony. Otherwise, that would be a safety hazard. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we hope everyone had a great long weekend. Um, I was out at Winnipeg Beach for, you know, Saturday night and Sunday, the, the two nice days of the weekend, let's say. Um, and yeah, yesterday Sunday was, was Sunday was was awesome. Yeah. And then yesterday was pretty brutal for most parts, most southern parts of the of the province. Um, but then you could stay inside all day and watch NHL free agent frenzy, which was the most like spent on free agency day ever. We'll get into like more of an NHL wide look later on billion. after the break. It, it went over a billion at one at at one point. Over a hundred players moved teams. Like it was insane. Uh, and in in the first hour, I think it was seven hundred million or more was spent. It's it was insane. Um, anyways, the Jets only accounted for. Five million of it, or five and a half million of it, and yet that's what we're going to start the show with today. Um, the, the Jets are never big players in free agency, but let's start with the players that they did bring in, and then we can talk about sort of the departures, the UFAs that left. I know we want to talk quite a bit about Sean Monahan, um, but just a quick hitter on Capo Kakinen, Eric Comrie, the two goalies coming back, and Colin Miller resigning at two years, one point five million. What did you think of the Jets' day? of the players that they actually brought in uh or or kept in Colin Miller's case. Well, I mean I'll start I'll start with the goaltending situation because it's interesting mm-hmm. because you signed two guys who are clearly going to be competing for the backup role. Um yeah. not exactly sure what the plan is after that because I know that I mean unless we they're they're just looking for more 
stupidity in terms of how many times they can get Eric Comrie claimed on waivers because this is what his fourth stint here after being picked up and dropped off, picked up and, and yeah. dropped off. He must live at the airport at this point. But I, I think that bringing him back is very much just like a familiarity thing. Could be also just like a, hey, Hellebuck like playing, you know, with him. That could be a, yeah. a thing like that. I actually, people were kind of just brushing it off. I actually really like the Kakinen signing. Um, mm -hmm. He played a lot of his time last year on San Jose uh, and there, especially the early part of he ended up getting traded to Jersey near the end of the year there, but he was not terrible on a team that wasn't going to win any amount of games in front of him. Uh, yeah. Like he, he was very positionally sound. Um, and I think that with the level of defense in front of him, he could actually be a, uh, above 900 goalie i think last he ended up finishing with an 899 which given the fact that he was playing in jersey and uh in san jose i'm you know hats off to you but i think that that's actually that's going to be a great storyline going into camp is the backup goaltending battle but i think i like on the surface i give it to capo kakinen um yeah. and then as you mentioned colin miller I, i'll be honest i was surprised to see him come back i wonder if they gave gave him some more words of reassurance that he would now be in the lineup and with schmidt's departure i think he saw an avenue for that and i i mean i i like colin miller i was very happy with the acquisition and i was to be honest with you quite disappointed with his usage late in the season mm -hmm. and to not see him until the fifth game of the uh the playoffs there similar to what we had with cole perfetti is it felt like too little too late trying to you know reclaim what you would you know put time into and assets into but I feel like I'll like the Colin Miller acquisition only if he's the partner with Vili Hainala. Because if we recall correctly, Vili Hainala plays really well with guys who are very positionally sound, nothing too flashy. Like he played fantastic with Brendan Dillon. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously they're not the same player, but Colin Miller is not going to, you know, do something super flashy and get super out of position by being really aggressive. So I think that. It's setting the foundation fairly well for a good third pairing of Vili Hainala and Colin Miller, um, despite all of the things I've seen that have Logan Stanley already penciled in on that third pairing. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with your kind of your full overlook there on the free agents. Kakinen, actually, I was doing a little bit of research. The two years he played with San Jose, his save percentage was sub 900. And since he played the majority of his career games with San Jose, his career numbers are sub 900 save percentage. But in his time with New Jersey, in his time with Minnesota before San Jose, yes, limited time with New Jersey, he only played like five games or so. But those every non-San Jose year, he had a above 900 save percentage is what I'm getting at. Um, and then the two years with San Jose, it was sub 900. So I think that's a a good enough foundation to bet on where you were the best defensive team in the NHL last season. Uh, he was on San Jose. Yes, he struggled, but I think he's talented enough as a goalie to step in and give Hellebuck some nights off. Like again, you have Connor Hellebuck. You don't need this guy to be Lauren Brassois, uh, who went and signed in Chicago. We'll talk about that in a second, but um, yeah, you just need him to be an effective backup. And I think he can be that either him or Eric Comrie, whoever, yeah, plays better in training camp, I guess. That, that'll be fascinating to watch. And then the Colin Miller thing, uh, I think I was the one uh, who said it maybe on an LFP Live, but I thought he was like the least likely to come back out of everyone. That's where um, I was at. And now think like now thinking about it, I don't know why I thought that way. I thought maybe there'd be a little bit more of a market for him. Like I think two years, 1.5 million per season is a bargain. For Colin Miller, yeah. uh, evolving hockey projected three years, three million dollars per season. Um, so I, I think this is a bit of a discount on Colin Miller and what you're getting, which is an effective third pairing defenseman, right shot. Um, the Jets bought out Nate Schmidt. I guess we should bring that up too. They bought out Nate Schmidt yeah. Sunday afternoon, so they need someone to play on that third pairing, theoretically, with a, a Vili Hanela or a Logan Stanley, which both players do need to be signed, uh, as RFAs, but. I, I really liked what Colin Miller did. I think he can move really well. And I think if the Jets want to play with pace, which Scott O'Neill kind of alluded to playing faster, um, Colin Miller can do that. He can move the puck. He's got a, everyone raves about his slap shot. We didn't see it much last year because he didn't play much, but apparently he's got an incredible shot. Um, 
and he can move his feet and play responsibly. And with Avili Hanala, I think that would be an effective third pair if that's where the Jets choose to go. Um, but either way, two years, 1.5 million per, that's just good depth. Like that's just yeah. a good signing. Um, let's talk about the players that aren't here anymore. Um, Sean Monahan signing with the Columbus Blue Jackets, five years, 5.5 million. Brendan Dillon, hate to see him go, uh, but he's off to New Jersey, three year deal, 4 million per season. Great deal for him. And he's going to a team that just loaded up in the off season. Um, and then Tyler Foley off to San Jose, four years, 6 million per season. And Lauren Bressois brought him up two years, 3.3 million per season to the Chicago Blackhawks, who also loaded up. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, some teams that winners and losers of free agency after the break. So stick around. But Brian, I want to get your thoughts, starting with Monaghan. That was the big conversation on, on Twitter yesterday. It was, you know, I, it seemed like half the fans were split on like, oh, uh, Monaghan, now who's going to be the 2C? Like the Jets are screwed. They're going to have to do this all over again. Stastny, Monaghan, like it's just a revolving door at 2C. But then the other half was like, well, he's battled injury. He's on the wrong side of 30. That's a lot of term, a lot of money. You've got Brad Lambert. Where are you? Where do you kind of fall? Um, we, we've talked about this quite a bit, but now that you see the contract that Monaghan was given, where are you kind of at with, with the Jets not deciding to bring him back and him ultimately choosing Columbus? I've never been more confident in my opinion that it was best for the Jets to move on from Monaghan. I knew that there was a chance yeah. that he was going to be paid, and I really didn't want the Jets to do term either. He got both uh, in Columbus, yeah. and I, I truly think that the uh, Jackets saved the Jets from killing themselves there, where it was spending that money on a guy who we're not even sure can maintain a 2C level of play for more than a couple of years. Here. He's only played more than 50 games in a season once in the last four years. Yeah. Like, he's not... Yeah a guy who consistently go out there and will play you 80 to 83 games, apparently um, every, uh, every year, but five by five and a half is insane for a guy who is, he's 30 now, right? Or is he 29? I think he's still 29. At, he's as turning the, 30 at this year. Cause I know he was drafted yeah. the same year as uh, Shifley. So I knew they were on the same age, but, or not or a year after Shifley, I should say. He's 29. But, birthday is October 12th. So he'll turn 30 is. before the start of next season. Or at So you're start. paying this guy until he's 35. The Jets do that. You're going to see more stories like the one about McCrory. I mean, like that, that's the thing. Like you're, you would be because the, like, let's put aside the, the youth thing for a second. You need speed in this league. Sean Monaghan's not fast and he's not going to get faster between the ages of 30 and 35. You would do that. You also have, that's the thing. Like we also saw it too, where uh, putting Cole Perfetti with another slow player and then having one fast one, it makes such a disparity in how chances are created and there's no transition game there. Yeah. You put Monaghan there for the next five years. You're, you're not getting faster as a team. And I, I think that it was best for everyone in the situation, Monaghan included, that this deal happened to send him to uh columbus and columbus to pay that amount and he can go hang out with johnny gaudreau again because i know those two were close um yeah. and then the jets aren't paying someone who will be turning 35 at the end of the deal you know for five years um so that's definitely where i'm at on that um i mean for the dylan one it sucks because you know he was obviously such a huge part of that top four and i i love yeah. what he you know he improved a lot from you know, the last few years and played really well this season. But I, I have to say, like, I, the deal that he got in Jersey, I, I it's another thing where I'm like, I'm not sure I would have wanted the Jets to do a, a three by four for him, yeah. given the fact that Dylan Sandberg is ready to move up. And then are you really paying a third pairing defenseman $4 million? Right. Right. So it, it worked out for uh, Dylan. It sucks that the Jets lost him because obviously he was mm -hmm. such a huge part of this team on and off the ice. Yeah. But it's another situation where money talks, right? Like it's it's not like I would much rather the Jets lose out on some guys and lose some bringing some guys back when it's going to hurt them if they did bring them back at that price point or they would have to pay a little more. Yeah, yeah. And this is the like I wrote an article, a shameless plug real quick. I, I wrote an article on this this very topic today uh, for the hockey writers. Go check it out. But. Winnipeg is not a go-to destination. We know this. 
players like Brendan Dillon want to stay here. He was very outspoken about that. But at the same time, like you said, money talks. And in the context of what the Jets have in their roster, letting Monahan and Dillon walk was probably for the better to raise the ceiling of this team for the next two to three years, where you bring back Dillon, you bring back Monahan, who apparently, according to Darren Drager, the decision was down to Columbus or Winnipeg. Like he had two contract offers and it was Columbus or Winnipeg. He chose Columbus. Did the Jets offer him five years, 5.5 million? Like, I don't know. We, we, we'll we never know. But if they did, like, I, we're, we're, yeah. Like they, they kind of dodged a bullet if that's the case. Because if you sign Monaghan for five years, 5.5 million, you don't have any room in your top two center spots for the next five years. Brad Lambert has to be a winger. Um, and Brad Lambert and Cole Perfetti, who was drafted as a center, both have to be a winger for the next five years at least. Um, and then Monaghan, like you said, isn't getting any faster. Uh, the Jets talk about wanting to play with pace. So I don't know if there was a bit of a disconnect there, but or what the Jets offered him. Uh, maybe it was a two-year deal with six million per. So it was more money shorter. You know, who knows? But I I do think that not signing to Foley, Dylan, and Monahan. Yes, it sucks right now, but in the grand scheme of things, letting the youth take over, I think, is a is a big win here. And the Jets still have a lot of cap space to make a move, uh, to facilitate an Ehlers trade and get back a defenseman with term or something, right? Like there's still or or a McGordy trade and pick up a a Shane Pinto, like I'm just throwing out a, a young second line center, and then pay Shane Pinto. Like they have cast that. To that's the that type here. of player, though. I would want to take the the chance on. Like I don't, I don't want to take mm-hmm. a risk on signing a Monahan or you know, a lot of people were talking about Henrique as well, who's 35. Like we know what these guys are. We know what they're going to be. Yeah, and very likely they're not playing at a second line center level. I would rather take a chance on trading for a guy and signing Shane Pinto who is still unproven for the most part in this league. And he missed a lot of time last year with the suspension, but yeah. I would rather the unknown with an upside than the known raise the floor, but not the ceiling kind of player. Yeah. And again, um, some people were bringing this up on Twitter, like Monahan next year or the year after, probably raises the Jets floor like I don't know the Jets also had really good results with Vladislav Nemesikov as their 2C so I don't better know better than what Monahan the, when he was there the difference the difference between Nemesikov at 2C and Monahan at 2C is not what is it three and a half million dollars annually of salary like they're pretty yep. close in terms of impact on the ice um if not Nemesikov's better so again Going with the fact that Nemesikov is better right now or or close to it, not three and a half million dollars in salary gap. And you have a guy like Brad Lambert who could be better than both. You don't know. But if you sign Monahan to five years, five and a half, you won't find out. You won't know. He'll be on the wing where he struggled to develop. Um, and, and then he went to Seattle and changed to a center and has been a center and has taken off and just had his best season of his career as a center in the AHL. Like you... And he might not even make an impact on the Jets next season, but that's not the point. If you sign Monaghan for five years, he's not making an impact at center at all for the next five years. Um, yep. So I I really think that if they did offer them offer him that and Monaghan chose Columbus, Monaghan did like the Jets a favor in a sense that you got these prospects. They're going to have to play at some point, and you can't wait until Brad Lambert's 26 to give him a center role in the NHL. And then, yeah, Dylan, Dylan Sandberg's moving up. So that much is is a lot for a third pairing, a guy who would be on your third pairing. I don't think Dylan's a third pairing defenseman, but that's what the Jets, I think, are believing. They're believing in Dylan Sandberg to, to slide up and take over that role. And then Tyler Toffoli, um, Nick Lynham said it on Twitter. Down the stretch, he kind of looked ready for some casual Sunday skates. So going to San Jose and... Uh, just chilling out with Macklin Celebrini and scoring 30 goals. Sound sounds fun. Six million per lie. season for four years seems, you know, steep. Uh so once again, another Given, thing where it seemed I mean, it seemed very clear from the moment he was on the podium after the season that he was ready to move on. And uh there he went. Honestly, though, if you told me at the trade deadline Tofoli was gonna sign in free agency for four years, six million, I would have told you that's low. 
But given how things went After down the what stretch, happened. yes, given how ineffective he was down the stretch, and then especially in the playoffs where he was demoted to the fourth line at times, um, six million, yeah, I, it does seem kind of steep. It seems like kind of a bet that he can be the player that he was for the past five seasons and not the past 15 games. But again, at the trade deadline, I would have told you like he didn't bring in like six and a half, seven. Um, he's a guy who scores 30 goals every year, can play with pace, but down the stretch, it didn't really look like it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, now he's going to go to San Jose. Macklin's probably going to choose to stay in San Jose. I know he has the option to go back to school. We'll see. Um, but they're giving him some help there, which is nice to see. Um, and I want to talk about the rest of the NHL and some other teams, specifically in the central division, Chicago, Nashville, making some big, big moves. But first, we're going to hear a word from DraftKings. So stick around. And when we come back, we're going to talk about our biggest winners and losers from day one of free agency uh, here on episode 98 of the Level Flight Podcast. Bet the action on the ice with DraftKings Sportsbook. The Florida Panthers may have been victorious this season, but it's never too early to start thinking about who you might pick as your Stanley Cup champion next season. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code THPN. That's code THPN for new customers to get 150 in bonus bets when you bet just 5 bucks. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888 789 Seven 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 seven, or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, twenty-one plus. Age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire one hundred and sixty-eight hours after issuance. See dkng.com/ice for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Copyright NHL twenty twenty-four. All rights reserved. Welcome back in, everyone, to episode 98 of the Level Flight Podcast. We are here recording this on Tuesday morning. Yesterday was day one of free agency. Not sure if we're going to have a Wednesday slash Thursday release this week. We'll see. That's kind of news dependent, I think, on whether or not Jets make another signing or make a trade or anything happens. But we'll definitely be there Sunday at 9 a.m. for the 20th edition, I believe, of LFP Live. So Jeez. we're closing in on 100 episodes. We're closing in on 20 LFP Lives. A lot of milestones coming up here. Um, make sure you join us Sunday at 9 a.m. on YouTube. Um, and thank you to DraftKings and Manscaped for sponsoring this episode. Brian, over a billion dollars was handed out. USD, which is like 10 billion Canadian when you think about it, <laughs> um, was handed out on day one of free agency. Um, so there's going to be a lot of winners, a lot of losers on, on you know what contracts were handed out. Free agency is always risk, risky. And as I wrote in my article, the theme of the day seemed to be GMs just handing out term sometimes to like lower uh, contract amounts or like A uh, AAV amounts on the deals. So they would go six years with Chris Tanev, right? Who's 35 and has a ton of injury issues. Like what, what that that's not smart, but if you lower the AAV a little bit uh, and you compete at this time with Matthews and, and Nylander and all those guys, sure. Then it makes sense. Right. Um, but that seemed to be the theme, just so many years, so much money being handed out. Who did you think was, was your kind of biggest winner? Um, and then we'll get into the, the biggest losers later on, but who did you say, who would you say had, had a good day with all that money being thrown around? <laughs> well, one that I'm going to throw out here is it's not necessarily a typical thing because it's not going to push them over the top, but we didn't really talk too, too much about them in our first part there before the ad, but I'm going to bring up the Chicago Blackhawks mm -hmm. um, and what they did around their very young group. And that included bringing in Laurent Brassois, who we've talked yeah. about a long time. He earned a, you know, contract raise a chance to, you know, be the starter, you know, have a chance to play more than 25 games in a season. Um, but he was just one of many moves. They brought in Tyler Bertuzzi. They they brought in uh, Alec Martinez and TJ Brody and a bunch of other guys that are, they've been in the league forever. Uh, and there's a lot of guys on that team who are very, very inexperienced. And, you know, navigating a rebuild as a young player when you don't have anyone around you who's kind of been through the situation uh, like that 
it's got to be difficult mm -hmm. because if you're just out there losing and there's nothing you can do about it, it's got to be kind of demoralizing. But when you surround guys like that with, uh, you know, that's the thing. A lot of these guys are still serviceable too. So mm -hmm. they're half decent older guys who have been in the league for a long time. They're going to help navigate you through that part of that rebuild. That's going to be, you're still going to lose. You're not going to lose as bad. You're going to be competitive and it's going to be fun for the fans. I think. Yeah, but I it's, agree. It's like just the way home. you said that, you're still gonna lose, but I mean, you'll you'll have fun doing it at least. Hundred percent. <laughs> no, but I I 100 percent agree with the thought process. Like last year, Connor Bedard was playing with nobodies, and it, it was part injuries. It was part like Corey Perry. Who knows what the story was there? But he just up and left and went to Edmonton. Um, but like they had Taylor Hall and they had Corey Perry. And, Hall got hurt. Perry left. Now you need like you need a Tavo Teravainen who they sent for three years to play a long time with Bernard with the next three years or a Tyler yeah. Bertuzzi who they sent for four years. You can play him the next two, three years with Connor Bernard, like give him consistent line mates um, and, and quality line mates where he can actually learn to win his minutes because last year his minutes, they the, the Blackhawks lost all minutes but they just lost the Bedard minutes a little bit less. Um, but he he needs to learn to, you know, like if he's going to play these top line minutes, you need to give him quality enough players to handle it. Um, and I think that that's, that's a great idea. Yes, he's only 18 or turning 19 going into this season, but still giving him good players now will kind of speed up his development, I think. Um, and we know he's going to become a superstar. So speeding yeah. up his development is as fast as you can is smart for the Blackhawks. Um Another winner, and I'm gonna I'm gonna bring them up. I thought the Edmonton Oilers had a fantastic day, and 100%. Ken Holland, Ken Holland's out as GM. Uh, I believe it's Jack Jeff Johnson. Jackson. Jeff Jackson. Okay, uh, Jack Johnson. I was talking about the the NHL defenseman. I don't anyways. or acoustic um, guitarist, or or that. Um, but yes, Jeff Jackson, and a lot of people like he said he didn't want to be GM, and now every single Oilers post that you see is like Hiram. Give him the give him the spot because he's had a better day today than Ken Holland's ever had. That that those are just some of the comments you'll see. But I thought he had a great day. Jeff Skinner um, being added into that top six on like a one year three million dollar deal is is great. They brought back Adam Henrique. Um, they they signed someone else too. Oh, Victor, Victor Arvidsson. Arvidsson. Yeah. Yes, I really like that deal. Like they've actually fully fledged out their top nine. You got another year of Dylan Holloway. You've got another year of Ryan McLeod young players who are going to get better. Um, Evander Kane's likely out. Apparently that relationship has soured after he didn't play down the stretch in the, in the finals, despite being healthy, but shocker. yeah, shocker, but like they're loaded again. And honestly, it, I think it's the best top nine forward group that the Oilers have had in McDavid's time here. You add that yeah. in with Bouchard Ekholm. And and hopefully they are able to bring back Broberg. I know they're kind of up against the cap. Maybe they'll when they move out Kane, if they if they are able to, then they'll sign Broberg. But I think this is the best team the Oilers have had. And the only thing that can really let them down is goaltending. But I loved their or day. the fact that they re-signed Corey Perry and he's a bad luck charm right. in the cup finals. <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, like again. They re-signed Matthias Janmark for like 1.4 million, who had a great playoffs and honestly a great finals and a great game seven. He scored the one goal for the Oilers. Like I thought he was good in the playoffs too, like solid bottom six option. I thought the Oilers, as much as it sucks, because we are a Jets podcast and they're in the Western Conference, and I guess they're not in the division. Uh, they are really good and they're going to be really good and stay really good. A team that is in the division though is Nashville, and I know we're split on this, so I'll let you go first on. I think that your thought process on them is that they had a, a good day. I just don't see it, but I'll let you talk about the predators. However you want to take it first. Um, just because they, they spent the most, they brought in Stamkos, March or so Brady Shea. Um, and I think that was it, but they handed out long term money to all three of those guys. What did you think of the predators day? Well, I, I think that there was some sort of internal discussion there with uh, Barry Trotz and the coaching staff and what yeah. they thought sort of about what their, you know, next couple of years is going to look like with their youth, you know, with, you know, with their goal. That's the thing. Cause they just re-signed uh, UC Saros to an eight year deal. They, yeah. uh, you know, extended uh, Alex Carrier. And yeah. 
I think that they came to terms with the fact that they're not overly confident with their long-term strategy and how their prospect pool looks. And they said, screw it. Let's go big on guys who have been around for a while and you kind of know what you're getting with them and try and win in the next few years here. Because in after the three-year mark, I don't know what the plan is there. But I think in the short term, though, they absolutely got better. Um, yeah. I, I I don't think that's in in any doubt whatsoever. Um, I, I like the fact that they said, you know what, we're gonna kind of make a splash here. We're gonna go get Stamkos and Marsha. So uh, they're really good friends. They play together in Tampa. Um, and then obviously the Brady Shea uh, thing was actually a little bit more shocking to me than everything else because it was it, I wasn't actually sure where he would end up, but uh, clearly they saw what they liked in you know Carolina and. I, I, I that, that's that's another team too, which maybe we can bring it up after. I liked what Carolina did, uh, and also not paying Brady Shea that much, I think, was a win, which is kind of the theme is teams that don't pay the biggest contracts, uh, and then get yeah. hurt by them. But back to Nashville, I, I think that I like what they do with this situation in the short term, and I think that Barry Trotz isn't even thinking about what happens after year three. I think he's like, I, th I think there's a yeah, chance here with you know, Roman Yossi still playing some of the best hockey of his career. UC Soros is still, you know, right up there with, you know, the best of them. They get a better backup this year in Scott Wedgwood because I know they had Kevin Lankin in last year and he really wasn't much of anything to rely on. Right. So I, I think that they saw a moment here where the next few years they could use these guys that are maybe coming to the end of their, you know, their useful, you know, prime here. Um, and you know elevate some of the younger guys they do have in the lineup elevate some of the older guys they have in the lineup uh and then yeah. rely on the fact that they still got a really good defensive core and uc saros and net um and so i'm not necessarily saying it's a good thing that they did what they did i just i i think i understand where they're coming from on it okay yeah that's fair i like i think i i agree with you they got better I think they're a playoff team next season. Like I'm looking at their, their projected lineup after making all of these additions and yeah, like they're good, but like Brady Shea got seven by seven. Jacob Slavin got like 6.3 million annually on his deal. Brady Shea is not better than Jacob Slavin. I'm sorry. I, I don't, I, I don't care what metric you look at. Jacob Slavin is one of the best defensive defensemen in the NHL. Um, he, he Brady Shea, I don't think is worth that much, but, and he's, and he's 30. So you're paying him for the non-prime years of his career more than what he's worth. Like, I I just, I, I really don't like that contract. The Stamkos one, again, I, he's 34. Yeah, he could score 30 goals it's name the value next two, two, three right? years. It's name value. Like, he'll improve their power play for sure. But I could totally see the last year or two being bought out, bought out of that deal. Um, but honestly, altogether, like, yeah, they got better. But three years from now... I, I guess they don't care that that's where I that's where I uh, kind of have the disconnect with the Predators here is they don't care about what this team looks like when UC Soros is 34 years old, I guess, um, where all I saw on day one of free agency is them shred any chance of them being good five years from now for the chance to be like a fringe playoff team slash three seed next year. Like, I don't know. I, I don't think they're good enough to. They're not better than Dallas. I don't think they're better than Colorado. It, depending on what the Jets do with Ehlers and McGordy and all this stuff, I don't know if they're better than the Jets. Um, they're like maybe them and the Jets are even, and that's the battle for the three seed in the in the central. Like I just I don't I don't think they got well, that much better to shred any long term flexibility they had. That's I, where I'm it, wondering I, I'm, what this is and if it's in fact because I, I saw a thing where there's a lot of chatter now about how Nashville's becoming kind of a destination along with the Florida yes. teams, along with Vegas. I mean, like the, the Nashville strip there is one of the most desired places for, I know, away teams and some teams try and get out of there as for quickly sure. as possible because they don't want them to spend too much time on, you know, Broadway. The Jets went a day there. late this year. I remember. Yep. And bonus was um, like, we're not giving them a day off in Nashville. But yeah, no. Yeah, and I'm wondering <laughs> if they're betting on the fact that they bring in these guys in free agency to say, oh, hey, hey, they wanted to sign with us. And they're betting on the fact that other players are going to do the same down the line. So when these guys are phasing out of the lineup and getting bought out, they're going to be able to pick up other guys who are reaching free yeah. agency. And like, I, I wonder if 
this is as much of a marketing decision as it is a player personnel decision where you know they bring in Stamkos after he was in Tampa for his whole career. They bring in Marcia So, who was such a huge part of that Vegas team. Um, for me, the Shea one is the one that makes the least sense because he's not a guy with pedigree. He's just a guy who's kind of been like in a top four rule for the last five years. But I'm not seeing him as like a guy who's like, oh, he is, you know, the number one. It's like if they brought in a Jacob Slavin, I would be like, oh, yeah, I, I get it. Whatever. Yeah. But the, the the first two, though, that I mentioned, it felt more like a, oh, hey, hey, everyone, look, they decided to come here and they really wanted to come here. Yeah. Think about that when you reach free agency next. So I don't know. Maybe it's a business decision uh, as much as it is a player personnel decision. Um, I could see I that. Know, kind of I could definitely see that, especially with what you brought up on how Nashville's becoming a hot destination for free yeah. agents and and for players to go play. Uh, another warm weather state. You said you talked about the strip there. Like I think I think they didn't really have that reputation for a while. Like when they were up against the Jets in the playoffs, uh, a lot of those players were either like traded for, drafted, and developed. They had a loaded team, um, mm-hmm. but they aren't really. Like I wouldn't have thought of them as a big free agent player until today. Um, so it was kind of an announcement, like, "Hey, people want to come here. We just signed Steven Stamkos, and you didn't." Ha ha. Um, I, I, and I get that part of it. I just, from a hockey standpoint, unless they win the Stanley Cup in the next two years, I don't know if these deals were worth it. Uh, that's that's where I'm at. Another massive loser, and we're at 37 minutes, so I will just we'll we'll keep this short from here on out. But Seattle gave Chandler Stevenson seven years. And six and a quarter. That was another deal I brought up in my article. Seven by seven for Brandon Montour. Yeah. And like Montour is a good player. But again, at 33, if he loses his feet a little bit, that deal is going to age horribly. I don't. And Pierre Lebrun brought brought it up. What what is Seattle doing? Uh, Also, Chandler Stevenson Stevenson as well. You have Matty Beniers and Shane Wright, who are theoretically going to be your top two centers for the next, I don't know, 10 years. So you're going to pay. Chandler Stevenson, six and a quarter to be on the wing where he's been less effective. Or, or your it, third it line make, center. Or third line center. Like I, Seattle. Like I get the caps going up, but I feel like teams are taking it far too seriously. Agreed. Yeah. Like the, the term in AEV that was being handed out was just unbelievable. Um, are there any other teams that come to mind on a, a, a big winner, big loser, handed out some good contracts, bad contracts, you brought up Carolina? Uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll bring up two Eastern teams here. One, I really liked what Carolina did. They bring in Scott Walker under $4 million. Sean Walker, but yes. Or Sean Walker. Yeah, not Scott Walker. Yeah. Uh, Sean Walker yeah. under $4 million. They this bring is, back yeah. Shane Goss to spare uh, yeah. after he was there uh, for a little bit there. But I, I liked what they did. And as, as I said, they sign Slavin to a big deal that's affordable. They don't yeah. sign Brady Shea to a big deal that's not. Um, and then to stay in the East, I was not a fan of what the Leafs did, you know, really rolling it. Well, I mean, like you're, you're, you're shooting yourself here in the foot because you're signing a guy like Chris Tanev, who was one bad block shot away from his career being over. And he's always almost, you know, done for the year. It feels, and you yeah. signed him for six years, full, no move. Full no move? Also, I didn't see that. Oh my yes. goodness. <laughs> um, but then you also, you get even older, you sign Ekman Larson, who obviously, yes, he was a big part of that Florida team. He's not nearly where he was in his prime. Like you, mm. you have that, but I only, I, like you, you re-sign Max Domi, you lose Tyler Bertuzzi, but then you, you're also rolling into the season with two guys yeah. in net who have not played a full year. You've got a yeah. tandem now of Joseph Wall and Anthony Stolarz. Like, are you really betting your season on the fact that you're going into yet another season where you don't have a proven starter? This is like the fifth year in a row where you have no true starting goaltender. And I think they really believe in Joseph Wool. Like, I, I, he played really well last season, got hurt for a long time, came back. So you're just betting so okay. much on such a small sample size. Totally, totally. Um, now that you bring up Ekman Larson, it reminded me. And the Leafs. It reminded me of what the LA Kings did, which I also hated. They gave Warren Fogle and Joel Edmondson like (laughs) four plus years and over $3 million annually. Again, this is a prime example of GMs being like, the cap's going up. So in two years, $3.8 million or whatever they gave Warren Fogle is really going to be like $1.5 now. Do you think Joel Edmondson, when he picked up his phone, was like, 
are you did you intend to call me <laughs> yeah I, I like they the dubois trade again i don't like saying that out loud but i think they lost that trade and then on the flip side of that there's two other teams who made a trade on this day the jacob chikrin deal for ottawa was brutal they brought back nick jensen in a third when you look uh, uh sends fans on my timeline are freaking out because you look at the Debrinket and Chikrin deals, what they gave up and what they got in the end for those deals, two just brutal moves. Um, and then Washington's Washington again, though. though. Washington again, though. Uh, Jacob Chikrin and then Matt Waugh for seven years, five and a half million per. I love that deal. I think he's he's really solid. Um, and Washington, I think, is one of the biggest winners for me this offseason. I think they've successfully kind of retooled on the fly. Again, all they need to do is get over the record and no one would care. Like if they miss the playoffs, I think they've done a good job though of doing that while also remaining competitive. Like they could have easily just got a couple guys just to feed him and then they would just be awful, but he would get the record. I think they're a playoff team. Yeah, I think they're a French playoff team as well. And they brought in Logan Thompson along with Charlie Lindgren. That's a good goaltending tandem. I like that. So I think they're going to be a playoff team next year. And I've really liked what they've done in the off season. We've gone long. We're over 40 minutes for an episode. That's unlike us, but it was a massive day. We had to talk about it all. Is there anything else you want to say on the way out uh, on our free agency kind of recap episode? Uh, Not really. I mean, as you said, like we're not 100% sure if we're doing another episode this week. Just all depends Depends. on time and everything and what happens. Um, But if you are here right now and you're watching this on YouTube Premiere, uh, thank you for sticking around and staying with us for a longer episode. Um, you know, last week, I know we had a lot of, uh, of, you know, viewers and a lot of technical difficulties, which we are going to try and avoid today. Um, but, uh, no, just, uh, the news has finally come around after weeks of us kind of just like plugging along and talking about the same things week after week. And exactly. I think finally we've been, we're back up to speed fully. And then I know this next week development camp is going to get going at some point. Um, yep. which we're going to try and get some content out about that. Maybe even content out there um Mm -hmm. we'll we'll see what we can do uh and then obviously if if you guys are out there you're at development camp if you see us come say hi uh we'll be absolutely would love to come chat with you about stuff that you know you've heard us say and i either you vehemently disagree with or would like to thank us for um (laughs) but no uh thanks for sticking with us for a longer one today and uh, i hope you enjoyed uh you know the episode obviously if you're you know still watching right now please like please subscribe um, you know, if you're if you're listening to this on audio, because this part will still be in the audio podcast. Hello, I haven't forgotten about you. Um, you know, rate and review it because it helps us a lot when to see when it you know shoots up the charts like that. So uh, that's the end of my little ramble here. Um, so I'll let Absolutely. you finish it up here, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in terms of Jets news over the next couple of days, like the schedule is supposed to come out today. Um, the like the, which the great video schedule. that they put out. Uh, yes, oh, it, Jamie, Thomas. Jamie Thomas got absolutely <laughs> decked by the looks of it. <laughs> and then goes, Jamie's we don't want great. you to get blindsided. Yeah, Jamie's awesome. Uh, that was a great video. But that's going to come out today. Apparently, the development camp schedule is going to come out today as well. And then Hopefully. today being Tuesday. And then I'd like, well, we're going to upload Thursday. this today, too. So, yes, real time. yes. So, yes, real real time. And then I believe day one is going to be Thursday of development camp. That's not 100% confirmed, but. I think inside. that's where we're headed inside 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 information. No, but um, we'll see again. Like Brian said, come on, come on down to dev camp. Say hi. We're going to be there every day that we can be. Um, and maybe we'll do an episode on Wednesday, kind of looking at the schedule, looking at our favorite games. We'll let you know, stay glued to our socials at level flight WPG. In the meantime, enjoy the next couple days. Enjoy the summer. Have a great week, everyone. And we will see you either Thursday or Sunday. We will let you know. Either way, thanks for checking out episode 98 of the LFP. See ya. See ya.